Uh, Jimmy Thang here with uh, Oculus VR co or founder, Palmer Lucky. And uh, Palmer, I have some, uh, a couple of questions for you. you Fire away. Cool. So, uh, you know, for those that haven't been following the VR scene, what is the status uh, of VR right now and what do you expect to happen in the next year? Right now, the status of virtual reality is that we've seen several years of consumer, kind of a consumer free market. We've seen a lot of developers, we've seen a lot of enthusiasts getting interested, we've seen a lot of content in development, but we haven't really seen any major consumer launches in the virtual reality space. And with people like uh, Oculus and Sony and HTC all entering the space at around the same time, over the next year we're going to see a huge explosion in the number of people who have had exposure to VR and a huge explosion in the number of virtual reality games that are being published publicly. So, you know, this isn't the first time that VR has tried to make an attempt at, you know, going mainstream. Uh, what's going to be, you know, different this time around? What sort of pitfalls are you guys going to solve or avoid? There's kind of two sides. One is the side we control. It's things like displays, optics, motion sensors. Those weren't nearly as good in the past. It's really only in the last few years that it's become viable to build a good virtual reality headset. But more than that, it's the proliferation of high-end computers for everybody. If you look back to the 80s and 90s when virtual reality was first kind of having its first serious run at mainstream penetration, uh, the best VR experiences were running on like SGI workstations that cost tens of thousands of dollars or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. But now everyone's computer is capable of rendering high frame rate 3D graphics. Maybe not photorealistic ones, maybe not to the level of quality we want from virtual reality in the near, in the near and distant future. Uh, but it's enough to make it work. And so for the first time ever, virtual reality is actually viable as something you can use at home. If you look back to the 80s and 90s again, uh, those companies didn't fail because of bad business or bad marketing or because consumers thought it was weird. It's because people just didn't have machines that could render an experience that was anything close to comfortable or compelling. And that's, that's all changed. So you think it's, it's sort of a timing issue, the convergence of all these technologies coming together? It's almost entirely a timing issue. It would have been impossible to start Oculus in even the mid-2000s. It wasn't until 2007, between 2007 and 2009 was when the technology was becoming viable to build something on the level of the development kits that we've shipped so far. Uh, do you envision uh, VR going mainstream? Like, it, and you know, to, to a greater extent, do you envision like traditional displays, flat screen displays perhaps going away? Eventually, but it's all, it's all a matter of time. Uh, traditional displays going away isn't so much a VR problem as an AR problem because people are always going to want to place displays into the real world or at least into something approximating the real world. But you're going to see convergence of AR and VR technologies into the same sets of headsets eventually. It'll be something you wear all the time or at least that you carry around all of the time. And the render horsepower is going to be on the headset or on, in your pocket, not, uh, not tied to a big desktop PC. Uh, as far as going mainstream, again, it's just a matter of time. It's a matter of having a good enough experience with enough content at a low enough cost. Right now, the math is a little wonky. It's pretty expensive to get into virtual reality. There's not a lot of content relative to other forms of media like film, music, books, even traditional games. Um, and the quality of the experience, while acceptable, isn't something that's going to make everybody truly feel like they've been teleported to a new place. We can reliably induce a sense of presence, a sense of making someone feel like they're in a virtual environment to their lizard brain, but tricking the conscious mind into ignoring the flaws is, is difficult. Uh, as the quality goes up and as the amount of content goes up and the breadth of content goes up so that you know, there's something for everybody, you know, that there's television shows at all different audiences today, not just you know, narrow, narrow slices of people. Um, you're going to see more and more people get interested in virtual reality because the quality is going to be very high. There's going to be things they're interested in playing. And then the only factor left is cost. And right now, if you have to have a fairly high-end PC and then buy a VR headset, you're kind of limited to a smaller audience. If you look into the distant future where everything is going to be rendered on the headset and we'll be able to get mobile system on a chips to render really incredible graphics, now you have something that is like mobile phones. It started out many hundreds of dollars and it dropped to sub $100 unsubsidized, something that m many people around the world can afford to use. And that's when virtual reality will become truly mainstream. Okay. Sorry for rambling on. No, 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 that's great. I mean, do you envision like it, uh, it coming out like with yearly iterations, like sort of a similar cadence to the smartphone market? Eventually, in the eventually, it's going to accelerate to that cadence. I think right now it's going to be a little bit longer than an annual or uh, you know several times annual cycle, which is what you're seeing right now with the really rapid refreshes of smartphones. Um, 
But I think that smartphones are actually, this is just my pet theory, they're going to stop refreshing so fast at some point in the future because there's not going to be much further for them to go. There's not going to be a reason to refresh every single year. You'll be able to have one solid device that lasts you for several years, just like you have a car. You know, People don't mm -hmm. replace their cars every year, or at least most don't. And the people who do, do it because they have enough money to do it for the fashion statement and for the having the new car smell and for having the absolute best performance. Uh, so I think that as phones reach kind of the end of the innovation cycle where they can't go too much further, they're going to slow down in refreshes. And virtual reality equipment, on the other hand, will refresh faster and faster uh, as we accelerate towards virtual reality experiences that are on par with real life. Yeah, that, that's kind of what's happening with the tablet market right now. That's you know slowed down a lot. It's, it's, it's a mature market. There's, there's not a ton. like The form factors have matured. The display resolutions are at a point where you don't get huge gains going much higher. higher. And the type of content that's available and useful for tablets, like you know, web content, touch content, doesn't necessarily benefit from really high-end 3D graphics. There's no huge push to you know, quadruple the power in my iPad. You know, as someone who's tried uh, VR you know, many times with uh, you know, you know, even this version of Oculus, um, I definitely think it's really cool. Uh, do you think that it could be something that's really cool yet be uh, a niche product at the same time? Because, I mean, that's sort of the same thing with like 3D printing. That's really cool, but you know, at the end of the day, it's sort of niche product or even like motion controls, which were at Vir the time. Virtual reality will be a niche product for, for at least some time. Uh, if you look at the Palm Pilot, it's kind of a good example. The Palm Pilot was very well known. It was very influential. But it wasn't something that everybody wanted to use and that everyone could justify. They sold millions of units, and a lot of people recognized the Palm Pilot and they built a great brand. But you wouldn't, like, I, you could say that a, the Palm Pilot was a niche product. It was, you know, techies, business people, people who wanted this, you know, portable computer that they could keep track of their calendar, their applications, their emails on the go. Uh, but eventually, the technology got good enough, the cost came down enough that we had things like the iPhone, where it really took off and everyone could justify having this type of technology in their lives, I think virtual reality is going to be on the same continuum. It can be successful as a niche product. It doesn't have to be mainstream and appeal to everyone in the entire world in order to be successful. But that is the eventual end goal, is to build something that everybody will have a use for. And I think that virtual reality will inevitably have a use for everyone, because anything you can imagine doing in real life, you can do eventually as good or better in virtual reality without physical laws governing what you can do, without monetary and fiscal laws dedic you know, uh, dictating what Traveling you can do. Traveling to Hawaii or something. Exactly. Like that. Experiences that are really limited to a very elite few right now could become available to everybody. And whether it's just for entertainment, like traveling to Hawaii, or education, being able to travel to different places, experience different things, potentially even experience things as they used to be in the past. We can't do that with any other technology. And if we look at human history, uh, whether it's you know, epics of old or music or movies and even modern video games, it's all a reflection of people's desire to see and do incredible things, things that are outside of their ordinary existence. Virtual reality is the ultimate conclusion of that, in, in my opinion. It's likely to be the final form of media. It's hard to come up with a form of media <laughs> that goes beyond something that can not only be its own set of media, but also replicate every other form of media that's ever existed. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, besides, besides gaming, what would you say is the biggest application <coughs> of VR? If you had to nail down one. I know you guys are working I, on an animation studio right now. So, so right now, gaming is going to be the biggest market, primarily because the gaming industry is the one with the technology, the tools, and the talent to build immersive real-time 3D content. In a way, they've been building up to it for decades, You know, getting 3D engines to run at high frame rates, trying to build graphics uh, in worlds that are photorealistic, that are very believable. Uh, and because of that, the first wave of VR content is going to be coming from, if not the games industry, people who cut their teeth in the games industry, people who learned all those techniques and apply them to things like business, telecommunication, virtual travel. Um, I think that in the long run, there's not going to be one type of content that dominates. If you look at books, for example, you have a very wide range of things. Some are educational, some are for fun, some are fiction, some are nonfiction. I think that virtual reality will be kind of similar. You're not going to see, you know, games are the primary focus or talking to other people over the across the world's primary focus. It's going to be a very wide range of uses. Okay. Uh, for those that haven't tried uh, VR before, how, how do you think it's going to change uh, gaming in a significant way? 
I think that in a way it's kind of the natural evolution of the trend gaming has had for the last few decades to become more and more realistic. Uh, not necessarily in gameplay or even in graphics, but to allow people to do things more naturally in games that are the types of things we, we actually do or um, really want to do in real life. Uh, you know, if you look back at games that existed 20 years ago, they were very limited in what they could do, not just in terms of graphics, but in terms of basic things like the amount of number of enemies they could render on screen or, you know, the different ways people could interact with the game. I think virtual reality eventually has the potential to allow you to take any experience you can imagine, anything you can think about, and build it into a game. Now, a lot of things that we imagine actually wouldn't make sense as a game. For example, um, a lot of the kung fu in movies is it, it's terrible. Nobody would actually <laughs> want to do it. and It's not effective, but it looks really cool on camera. If you wanted to do something like that in virtual reality, there's no reason you can't make that happen. Whereas that's not going to happen as long as we're you know, controlling a view on a 2D screen holding a, holding a controller. Cool. And then a uh, final question. Uh, what would you say your most uh, proud moment of working with the Oculus team has been so far? Tough question. It's a, it is a very tough question. I mean, the, so one of the reasons, we're like super focused on actually shipping a product. Like it's so far we've shipped dev kits. We've done a lot of things we're proud of. Like we've made a lot of great deals with developers uh, where we've helped them, you know, take content that wasn't going to exist and help them make it so that, so that they're able to make it, make it happen. And that's been really rewarding because it's like, wow, we're actually saving something that someone's put love into. There's been other times where we've made really huge hardware advancements that I'm really proud of because people you know, slave away at these things to prove out some of the crazier concepts we're building. Uh, but I'd say like, the, the, the proud moment we're all waiting for is when we actually ship something to everybody, where we're actually putting a stake in the ground and saying, this is what Oculus is, this is what virtual reality is, this is something good enough for everybody. And so far we haven't done that. We're kind of still in a, in a, in a startup mode where we're crunching towards that first stage of delivering a product. And so I don't want to say like, wow, we're so successful and I'm just so proud of my whole team. Like, we're all proud of each other, but until we get there, we don't want to pat ourselves on the back too much. Awesome. I, I'm, I'm super excited and you'll be able to get your hands, or rather your head, I guess, on a Oculus Rift headset sometime in Q1 next year. Your cheeks and forehead. <laughs> that too. All right, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you.